going to uh, to focus particularly on solar PV for poultry farms today. I'll give you a little bit of background on who I am, what we do, the Agores project, and then run through, um, I suppose, a, a, an example of for, for solar PV on a poultry farm. So uh, I work for the Atlantic Technology University, which was until recently a bunch of institutes of technology, and now we've all joined together um, uh, on the Northwest uh, of Ireland. And uh, I work in a research unit called the Contract Research Unit. We're an outreach, a dedicated outreach service. So none of my team are, are lecturers. We, all of our work is with um, um, enterprises, communities, farmers, and, and individuals. So that's us there in the middle. So we, because of our work is external, we tend to work with a lot of state agencies and, uh, and development associations and uh, um, other, other bodies like that. A couple of the projects we're currently involved in are the Sustainable Energy Communities Program, which is a community support program run by SEAI. So we're mentors for that in the border and west regions. And then the, the one that's more relevant to this evening is Agores, which is a, a European research project aimed at policy improvement, but we are trying to get as much tangible outputs from it as possible. The, the aim of Agores is to increase the uptake of renewable energy specifically in the agricultural sector. Now in Ireland, um, um, energy is, is a small part of most of agriculture. It's a bigger part of some sectors um, like the poultry sector where there would be a significant energy demand. So the I'm just going to give a little bit of background to the microgeneration support scheme and the emerging small scale generation support scheme. So in terms of policy support for renewable electricity, it's it's improved greatly in the last year, year and a half, and looks to improve even more this year, because the, it, for, for a long time we were lagging behind Europe and we were actually in contravention of some of the um, energy directives. So the micro generation support scheme, which received a lot of press last year, both good and bad, is now in place. Um, some suppliers are still, I suppose, uh, not in a position to offer a tariff yet, but they will, and they're mandated to do that. So that's the uh, that covers installations up to 50 kilowatts. Um, so it will provide a, a tariff for um, for export for for non-domestic and domestic. There are some improvements along with that in terms of grid connection and planning process as well, and certainly they're they're very welcome at this stage. The, the larger scale then over um, half a megawatt, that's the renewable electricity support scheme and that's more of your grid connected wind farms and solar farms. The piece that's coming emerging this year and it's been out for public consultation is the small scale generation space and everyone expected that that would simply fill the gap from 50 kilowatts up to 500 kilowatts. In reality, what's happened is it's actually going to overlap with the larger end. So it's going to go up to six megawatts. But um, some of the details are available under uh, the public consultation document. You'll find it on the department website. But essentially, it looks to be an extension of the microgeneration support scheme in that it will provide a tariff for export as well. Now, this may or may not be relevant to farm um, scenarios if you're availing of the TAMS grant. And I'll explain that a little bit when, a little bit further on. The intention of these schemes is to address what's, what's called the viability gap. So for anyone investing in a solar PV, you're gonna have a capital expenditure and you're gonna have some operational expenditure throughout, throughout the life. It wouldn't be significant for solar PV. Most of your investment is upfront. Obviously your savings there, your return on investment is mostly the savings from self-consumption, and prior to there being any tariff for export, then that was the viability gap to make this up. So now uh, the microgeneration support scheme is a combination of grant for some scenarios and then a clean export guarantee or a clean export premium to make up the rest of that gap. So the installation grants are available for, for any project up to six kilowatts and there's a 2,400 grant there. The clean export guarantee is paid by the electricity supplier um, and that's usually applicable to uh, domestic installations. But then for non-domestic, there's also the clean export premium that can be availed of. And in that case, you can, you can apply for a fixed tariff for 15 years. What that does is it gives you some, um, well, it gives you confidence in what you're going to get 
over the 15 years. So looking at solar PV for farms, uh, the first question I do ask everyone um, is, is, the, is solar PV right for your farm? So in working with AgroRes, we would have, we would have had done a lot of work with Chagask um, and directly with some farmers where, where we could. And in many cases, farmers look at their sheds and they see that great potential to put panels up there, capture sunlight and convert it to electricity. But the real, um, the real answer to the question is solar PV right for your farm is if you can use a significant portion of that solar generated electricity. That's where it will make the most sense. So to understand what solar PV does, it generates electricity during, during sunlight hours, daylight hours. It doesn't need a strong sunny day. It will generate some electricity whenever there is, there is light out there. Obviously, it starts at sunrise, it ends at sunset and peaks around midday. That, so that's the daily cycle. The other uh, thing to be aware of is there is a, a seasonal cycle too. So in May or June, on a day in May or June, you're going to get about five times more than you would get on a winter day in December or January. And the best return of, for inv of investment is to use that generated electricity in your own business as it's being generated. That's, that's your best return. So to put some of that in context, if we were to look at a daily electricity demand and solar PV generation profile, this is just a sample. The gray line here being uh, an example of just a sample building demand. So it starts, maybe something starts around seven o'clock in the morning and you've got a lot of activity and using a lot of electricity. It might dip during the day and then maybe you've got a, an, an afternoon demand as well. So that's your electricity demand. The solar PV output then is the orange line here. And this would be, this is controlled by the, by the sun, by the climate. We don't have any control of that. So if these were the, the overlapping demand and generation profiles, what we would have here is quite a lot of the solar PV being used in this green hatched area. And that's your best value because that every kilowatt hour you're, you're using from your rooftop solar is saving you a kilowatt hour uh, charge on your electricity bill. The piece in the orange hatched area then will be exported to the grid. And in that case, you'll get the export payment, but that's usually considerably less than your what you're paying for electricity. So that's less value to you. In farming sectors that have a daytime electricity demand, pig and poultry are, are obvious ones. Uh, certainly there's, there's very often internal daytime lighting. There's pretty much always ventilation, the feeding systems, heating pads, things like that. For poultry in particular, um, with egg producers, where there isn't so much heating demand, electricity is probably the main demand. And ventilation will generally, the requirement uh, increases in the summer. So that is a very good match for solar energy. There are, there are other sectors like horticulture, particularly where there's a lot of refrigeration. Again, that tends to, to increase the demand for that increases in the summer. And of course, that's a good match for solar energy as well. There's potential in tillage, but that's very seasonal. And then with dairy, um, because the peak demand with dairy is your morning uh, milking cycle and your evening milking cycle, this requires some kind of a buffer, a lot more consideration in how you get that solar energy to serve those two peaks that don't match well with the, the daily solar peak. So, um, we would always encourage every every business, every farmer to look at efficiency first. So rather than you know trying to get cheap electricity from your roof, uh, the the cheapest electricity is 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 not using it if you don't need it. So the the simply the, the obvious things that most of us are aware of now, LED lighting is is obviously um, you know a, a a low energy lighting system. Motors and fans um, can be fitted out with uh, or refitted with uh, variable speed drives that. Does, it reduces wear and tear, among other things, but also improves efficiency. Building insulation, if there is heating required, and if you're going to avail of things like the SSRH, your building as insulation will be assessed and will have to be brought up to a, a certain specification in any case. And then maintenance, so we, you know, we couldn't stress that enough, and most people who run industrial commercial operations will be aware of how important that is. So having it as a regular and scheduled thing rather than a, a reactive maintenance schedule. So here's an example for a 50 kilowatt solar PV 
um, installation on a poultry farm. So that's it's a relatively modest um, sort of PV installation, both depending on the size of the farm. But um, we will see this as as, qu as quite a common installation size. We're estimating here capital costs of 65,000 based on about 1300 per kilowatt peak. We've included some O&M costs, 500 euros a year. A lot of the O&M can probably be absorbed within an existing or an ongoing maintenance schedule. And I've included a, a, an inverter replacement cost at year 15. Some components don't, will not last for the full life of the system. The inverters tend to have to be replaced around year 15, but your solar supplier should be able to advise you on that as well. For the cost of electricity in, in terms of let's say the savings that we're making, we, we've included here a cost of 30 cents per kilowatt hour. I realize that can be up and down. At the moment, it's very volatile, but I think that's a reasonable estimate for this example. And then the clean export guarantee here, we've allowed for a fairly modest 13.5 cents per kilowatt hour. And we've kept that at the, the 15 year tariff payment. So for that 50 kilowatt solar PV example, and I think I placed it in um, somewhere in Leash, in the middle of Ireland, um, that will produce approximately 43,000, 43,500 kilowatt hours in year one. That does reduce slightly over time. There are degradation to the panels, but it's nothing more than about uh, maybe 10% overall over 20, over 20 or 25 years. So. It, 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 it's manageable. So essentially knowing the overall cost of the system and knowing how much it's going to produce over a life of 20 years, this can tell us what is the levelized cost of electricity. What that LCOE is essentially what you're initially investing in. So your main investment is buying you approximately 43,000 kilowatt hours every year for the next 20 years at a price of nine cents per kilowatt hour. So on that basis, that makes perfect sense as opposed to paying 25, 30, 35, 40 cents per kilowatt hour over that 20 year period. It's not going to provide you with all the electricity you need. You're still going to be buying some from the grid um, unless you, you put in a, a massive system. But for your investment, that's, that's what you're buying. So obviously, if you're using that to offset um, your, your imported electricity, that's saving you, if, if, you're, if your import electricity is, is costing you 30 cents, that's saving you 21 cents for every kilowatt hour. If you're exporting that, you're making, at, if you're exporting that at 13 and a half cents per kilowatt hour, you're making uh, four and a half cents on every kilowatt hour that is exported. So it's just to reinforce the point that self-consumption is your best value. Now, what we did here was a comparison between the micro generation support scheme tariffs and the TAMS grants. Now, the TAMS grants, when we did this, this analysis, the TAMS grants were still being, um, I suppose, supported at 40% for most firms. We, we've all seen the announcements now that that is going to go up to 60%. So when you see the analysis here, the TAMS scenario will improve on what I'm showing you here. So the, in, the, in the MSS of the microgeneration sports scheme scenario, what we're saying is there's no capital grant, but you do get a tariff for what you spill to the grid. In the TAM scenario, you get a, a, capital, invest, uh, a capital grant of 40%, but you're not getting any export payment. The reason we've done that in this comparison is that the TAM's conditions currently are written saying 100% of the energy produced or the electricity produced by the solar PV must be consumed on site. The, our reading of that is that there won't be any export allowed, or if you do uh, export, they're somehow going to restrict the payment. Nobody's too sure of how that's going to happen, but regardless, we did this comparison anyway, based on the, those kind of worst case scenarios. We, we did, with those two scenarios, we compared self-consumption rates of 40% up to 100% in 20% increments. And this is the outcome here in terms, we, we've, I suppose, presented the, in value, in ter, the value in terms of internal rate of return or IRR. And the, the blue columns are the micro generation support scheme scenario. 
the orange columns are the TAM scenario. So you can see here that even at a TAMS grant of 40%, essentially nearly all of these are uh, your, your, it's a more beneficial scenario to go for the TAMS grant, to go for the capital grant for farmers. Certainly if, if we up, update this to a 60%, when that's actually, actually confirmed with the terms released, the TAMS grant will, will make the investment in solar for, for most farms um, much more, give you much more confidence in that. Um, but as you can see also that the more you self-consume, the higher your rate of return is on this in, in both scenarios. So in terms of, of planning a solar PV project, if you're thinking about this and preparing for when the TAMS grant is available, um, we are trying to train as many farm advisors as possible in, in simple methods of, of presenting this and assessing this, but also there's, there's, you can do it yourself. So the, the ideal is to have a very good understanding of your daily demand profile. A lot of you will already have systems in place where there'll be uh, 15 quarter hour meters and you can get that information if you don't have it already um, on, a, on a, a management system, but you should, certainly should be able to get it from your supplier. If you don't have that kind of a meter, simple um, self-install versions are available like these two that I've got on the, on the slides here. I actually have one in my own house and we've used, we have three phase versions that we've used to help businesses um, assess for solar PV. In terms of planning, as I was saying, that has improved greatly. Essentially now for roof mounted systems, there is no planning required. You do have to confirm exemption with your local planning, planning authority. Um, so a roof mounted system does not require planning permission unless you're in one of these solar safeguarding zones or SS, SSZs. They are essentially buffer zones around airports, um, around helipads that you might have at, at, at hospitals and things like that. But even within those, you can go up to 300 meter squared solar array as a roof mounted array, and that's approximately 66 kilowatts. So for many installations, even in the solar safeguarding zone, you're still going to be planning exempt. If you're opting for a ground mounted um, solar PV array, you can go up to 75 meters squared without applying for planning permission. And then that, that's essentially about 17 kilowatts. The grid connection limits, um, if we're talking about micro generation, uh, which is the 50 kilowatt limit, then you're, if you have single phase electricity, you can connect up to 17 kilowatts. If you have three phase, you can connect up to the 50 kilowatts. What you're applying for in, in a grid connection for an export is an MEC or a maximum export capacity. On your electricity bill, you'll already have an MIC, which is your maximum import capacity, and that will tell you the limit the, of your export capacity as well without having to change your, um, your, um, your electricity connection. The other couple of things to consider are the roof condition. Again, most of your installers will advise you on that if, if you get to a point of, let's say, procuring a, a system, but it would be a good idea to consider it. If the roof is in poor condition, you may need some additional works there. And another area of support not to be neglected is the accelerated capital allowance. So just make sure when you go to the market that your installer is providing equipment that is on the triple E register then that allows you to essentially claim the, the total purchase of value of that as a, as a tax write-off in the first year of purchase rather than over, over, over eight years or, or however it's normally done. That's essentially it.